welcome to the firm. On the show this week, the firm polls 19 lawyers and consultants on FDI control and caps. And a Supreme Court decision that says the SCRA does apply to unlisted companies as well. Technically, the Jet Etihad deal should have sailed through FIPB. Etihad was not getting the power to appoint majority of the directors on Jet's board, but FIPB refused to be limited by its own definition of control. And instead, like SEBI and the takeover regulations, FIPB also focused on the various affirmative rights that Etihad was being granted. Well, that approach has now been formalized. This week, the government announced a new definition of control under the FDI policy. It goes beyond the right to appoint a majority of directors to include management control and control over policy decisions. In anticipation of this new expanded definition, we reached out to 19 lawyers and consultants asking if they would approve of such a change. Here's the firm poll on FDI control and caps. Who would have thought that a legal definition would make the headlines again and again and again? It's almost as if all 1.2 billion people have been waiting with bated breath for a new definition of control under FDI policy. Well, let me tell you, the lawyers are not. At least most of them aren't. Ten of the 19 lawyers polled by the firm are not in favor of a change in the FDI policy control definition. Lutra's Rajiv Lutra says, clarity and certainty are the need of the hour. IDFC's Rajiv Uberoy says, the definition needs to be kept very simple and clear without any ground for any interpretation. Tata Group General Counsel Bharat Vasani, ACB's Abhijit Joshi, TSK's Anand Desai, Prophet Bailey's Sanjay Asher, former Party Group General Counsel Vijay Sampat, Kunal Thakur of TTA, Vivek Mehra of PWC, and Tri Legal Sridhar Gorti agree. Sridhar Gorti says, government supervision over what rights a foreign shareholder can or cannot have is not desirable. My key sort of objection to the expansion of this definition uh, uh, is essentially one of subjectivity. You know, when you, when you use words like control over policy and management, this is a very wide ambit. Um, how much is too much? You know, the difficulty is that when you're trying to structure a transaction and when, you have, when, when a foreign investor has to decide what it can or cannot do, uh, what are the interests that it's allowed to protect, um, there is no clarity. And unfortunately, what tends to then happen is that you take a conservative view and uh, you, 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 know, you, you do something and then a few months later you find out that, you know, in fact, you've tripped the line on control. So the biggest concern that we have as, um, uh, you know, when we are advising our clients is, is certainty and clarity. So um, I, think, I think that, you know, when you define control in terms of uh, a shareholding percentage number or the ability to appoint a majority of the board, that is something that is clear. This is a guideline that, you know, we can all get behind and, uh, and, 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 and structure in accordance with. But there's some heavyweight opinion against that. Despite concerns that a new, expanded definition will introduce subjectivity, Amar Chand's Cyril Shah, Ketan's Hagrid Ketan, Aditya Birla Group General Counsel Ashok Gupta, GSA's Vikram Raghani, EY's Paresh Parekh and KPMG's Puneet Shah are in favour of a new definition. Any rights which are given which is out of the ordinary and expressly provided for and has implication for change of uh, management should be included in the definition of control. But three lawyers took a middle approach. Referring to the now old definition, Sandeep Bhagat of SNR says, it provides certainty to an investor. However, it does not specifically take into account other factors that may be relevant to determine control. BMR's Vivek Gupta says, some basic operating guidelines as to how inter -say arrangements should be viewed should come in, without that being necessarily part of the control definition. Prem Rajani agrees that the unexpanded definition could perhaps get misused. The same should be modified only if clear guidelines are provided along with it to indicate what will be considered as acceptable rights for an investor. In an attempt to address abuse, um, where, where, where somebody may be trying to circumvent a particular policy through, uh, through contract, 
um, I think what is being done is far more sweeping and will create much more difficulty in, in ordinary you know, bona fide transactions where people are just trying to understand what is the legitimate way to structure, structure a joint venture in the Indian context. So I think it's a bit of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. At the heart of Sridhar's objection and that of the others is the issue of minority protection rights. Affirmative rights or vetoes that minority investors often insist on as protection against the investment going foul. Minority protection rights are commonly used across the world. But in India, SEBI has often taken the view that such rights amount to control under takeover regulations. Now nobody knows how many of these rights and in what combination trigger control. So if FIPB, armed with this new definition, starts speaking the same language as SEBI, it could impact many, many foreign investments, not just those in sensitive sectors such as aviation. Especially because in FDI policy, who controls the parent company is also used to determine whether the downstream investment is Indian or foreign, which is why most lawyers we spoke to voted against an alignment of the FDI policy definition of control with that in the takeover code. Of the 19 lawyers we polled, only seven agree that the FDI policy definition of control should be aligned with the takeover code definition of control. Hagreev Khetan says the idea of having a consistent definition across different legislation where you are acquiring control or you have control is definitely required. Sandeep Bhagat says perhaps there should be a single clear definition of control which all regulators agree with. Cyril Shop adds, control must mean the same thing regardless what the context is. But the majority, that's 12, voted against an alignment of the two definitions, arguing that FDI policy and takeover regulations have different objectives. Parag Kasani says if you try to adopt a common definition, like if you take a takeover code definition and transplant it into FDI policy, in my opinion, it would be an immensely impractical decision. DSK's Anand Desai feels quite the same. The purpose is different, and trying to extend the same definition of control under the provisions of the FDI policy will have absurd consequences. Absurd consequences versus abuse of FDI limits. I'm sure we'll hear much more on that in the days to come. Okay, enough about control. Time to move on now to the next big issue of caps. While we had their attention, we also asked our 19 respondents if the number of FDI limits, 26%, 49%, 51%, 74%, should be reduced. The Mayaram Committee recommends retaining just two FDI limits, 49% and 74%. 17 of the 19 lawyers we polled want the number of FDI limits reduced. Of the two that don't, Sanjay Asher says, in sector specifics there may be a need for three limits and therefore three limits are essential and necessary rather than having two limits. And Prem Rajani's point is, that is not the only solution to boost our troubled economy. But even he agreed with Vijay Sampat and 13 others that the two most appropriate limits are 49% and 74%. Ashok Gupta, though, disagrees. Any industry where investment is allowed up to 49% should not be a matter of concern because foreign investment would carry with its only minority rights and the Indian company will be continued managed by Indian, Indian institutions or Indian company management. Over and above, we decided to give 51% control to foreign investment. As a conscious decision we have taken, it makes no sense still to retain minority shareholding because minority shareholding interest is still protected by law. It is only the interest of block of shareholder who, uh, or block of shareholder who are retaining 26% that they exercise certain rights and in many a sense, in many situations, uh, they are in a position to stall special resolution, which may or may not be in the interest of the company in the long run. So putting an artificial limit of 75-4% in my view will not make the investment or FDI policy very attractive. I would 100% agree with what Mr. Gupta has said. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's really no need to have so many complicated thresholds. I am 
I'm completely in favor of, uh, you know, reducing complexity to the maximum extent possible. In this environment, we need to be doing everything that we can to kind of uh, uh, simplify our uh, FDI regulations and uh, and promote foreign investment. So um, I, I would say that, you know, given the choice, I would certainly get behind just one limit of 49%. Once you cross over 50, then, you know, really it shouldn't matter how far you've gone. That should be left to the economic realities and the negotiations between uh, joint venture partners. Only one lawyer... Cyril Shroff picked 26% and 51% as the most appropriate limits. Now, about 49%, Mr. Shroff says, there is always a fudge at the last 2%. There's all sorts of stuff that happens there. Fudge, let's end on that note, because it's always good to end on a sweet note. For more on our FDI control and caps poll, you can visit our website, thefirm.moneycontrol.com. With that, let's take a quick break on The Firm. Up next, the Supreme Court decision that says the FDRA does apply to unlisted companies as well.